Chair of Geography, welcome everybody during this uh, Geo Week. This is Geo Week, and we're having a great week. Today we have the tape, tape Colloquium in Human Geography, and it's good to join you all for that. Nice to see visitors from other parts of the campus. Um, for new students, this is part of the experience during the year when we have um, continuity and change. We have events that reflect on the history of the department and on changes in the discipline. We also have a chance to meet some uh, some new folks, and this today we're delighted to welcome three members of the Tate Clan who are back here to visit. So we have Ian, Julie, and Mike. Welcome to the department. You're going to hear a little bit about uh, your relative here in a second. <laughs> um, so this is an important aspect of the life of the department. Uh, we celebrate the vis visits. We will put your name on the notice board so you'll be trying forever. <laughs> so since 1996, actually, the geography has held the Edward J. Tate Colloquium. It's a marquee event in our calendar. Uh, it's one of two special colloquia we hold each year. And this is named in honor of Ned to reflect his unique position in the discipline, both as a geographer and as a human and physical geographer in some respects. Uh, Ned shaped the department as we see it today, as I said before. Um, he continually stated and restated that undergraduate and graduate education were intimately linked, and that this theme, I think, as we continue to stress, the connection between education and research is fundamental to what we do. Um, as a teacher and mentor, uh, Ned was a major contributor and a towering figure of the discipline. He was the third chair of the department, succeeding Guy Harold Smith, who himself had a long reign as chair of the department, and uh, he laid the foundation for the modern department that we see today, recruiting many of the scholars who have laid the groundwork for, for the discipline of the uh, So this is, colloquium series is named in honor and recognition of Ned's service as chair from 1962 to 1974. And uh, it's fitting today, I think, that we mark this lecture with a special visit from Karen O'Brien, professor at the University of Oslo, an internationally known scholar, and we're pleased to welcome you here today. And as you'll find out, we have a formal introduction by Joel, who will say that in a second, but not just yet. <laughs> One more little trope here. Uh, we, we have an A to Z of scholars who presented in this series, from Agnew to Zimmer. We have Stuart Eldon, Robert Kitchen, Don Mitchell, Jennifer Walsh, Larry Mann. Billy Lee Turner, Michael Watts, Susan Hansen, Audrey Kobayashi, and the list goes on. A who's who of, of human jargon, really. I know Ned would be proud of our advances and would appreciate the dedication that these scholars bring to the department. And uh, we're very thankful to Karen for her generosity in visiting. I know she spent a nice lunch hour visit with many students today. And thank you so much. Uh, let's join in welcoming Karen. Customary, Joel will make a presentation here reflecting your career, and then later, please join us for a reception in the lobby. Uh, so thank you. Oh, we also have a presentation. Let's not forget that. Um, some special prizes. <laughs> well, an umbrella, which might be useful, <laughs> and a T-shirt. If you can fit them in your luggage, you're welcome to have them. <laughs> All right, thanks, Morton. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to briefly introduce Karen O'Brien, as you know from. Morton's introduction. She's a professor at the Department of Sociology and Human Geography at the University of Oslo, where she leads a project on responding to climate change. And if you're interested about that, you can check out this website right there. Since receiving her PhD in human geography from Penn State University in 1995, Karen has been passionately studying the ways that societies respond to change, particularly large-scale environmental change, and to understand how those changes interact with global processes to exacerbate or reduce inequality increase or decrease vulnerability, and create conditions or not for sustainability. Much of this research, early work was reflected in her book, Environmental Change and Globalization, Double Exposures, which she co-authored with Robin Lachenko, and which was awarded the AAG's Meridian Book Award in 2008. For those of you who aren't AAG files, that's basically like the highest <coughs> award the AAG gives for a book each year. Karen was also one of the lead authors on the adaptation chapter for the uh, IPCC Fourth Assessment Report, and along with some of the people in present company, she was one who shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, which was awarded to the IPCC. Uh, she also has published a really large number of very important articles specifically on the theme of vulnerability and climate change and environmental change. And in fact, if you go to Google Scholar, as I did yesterday, to kind of find out where those stand and things, it turns out that on the keyword of vulnerability, she's number one most cited author. 
Uh, so a, a lot of influence in that field. Uh, over time, however, there's been a marked shift in her work from the core theme of vulnerability to climate change, which was, I mean, I'm sure it remains a central concern, but clearly in recent years, her work is increasingly centered on the broader question of socio and cultural transformation. In other words, the question of how we could produce transformation, uh, how socio-technological transitions might be related to different worldviews, whether there are certain conceptions of the world, for instance, that make transformation of the sort that is clearly needed more or less likely. Given the state of the world today, I think it would be very difficult to overstate the importance of such thinking. And so it's really a great pl pl uh, privilege for us to have Karen here to share her thoughts with us. So please join me in welcoming Karen to answer a question that I know we all want to answer, which is, is it possible uh, to imagine that we could meet still the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to present this lecture. It's really an honor and um, I'm really a privilege to be back at Ohio State. I was actually here in 1996, not for the first big lecture, but um, <laughs> to visit and um, I've been very much inspired by a lot of the work that has been going on, as you can see. Uh, um, and as Joel mentioned, you know, a lot of my research has been looking at climate change impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, and the impacts on human security. Um, what does it actually mean for people um, now and in the future? And about 10 years ago, you know, understanding what we know about climate change, we start to really think about, you know, that this actually isn't a good idea for society. So how do we actually avoid climate change and the transformations that it will cause us? And deliberately change. And um, a lot of my research that I'll be, it's been inspired by work um, working with the IPCC. And this is probably a very familiar graph to all of you about you know the difference between a world with substantial mitigation, where we see changes, this is you know the changes of about two degrees, but you can still see that it's not the same all over the world. And even a half a degree is too much for many groups and communities and things. And you know, this, is, this is not a, an ideal picture, but without additional mitigation, we see a world that is markedly different and dramatically different. And from the um, IPCC, they really point out that the future is a choice for where we are at right now, in 2017. And the synthesis reports that um, you know, really emphasizes that without additional mitigation efforts, beyond those in place today, and even with adaptation, warming by the end of the 21st century will lead to high, very, to high to very high risk of severe, widespread, and irreversible um, impacts globally. And we say that with very high confidence. So, so that as a starting point, I think, should get everybody to look, okay, future is a choice. What are, you know, I don't know how many people choose that right-hand side, but that is very much where we seem to be going. Um, some articles have come out in Nature and Science showing that we have about three years to safeguard the um, climate, to bend those curves. And three years is not a lot of time. A lot of times that I was lecture, if I don't update my notes, it's like, you need to change by 2014, 2015, 2016. And we keep pushing that, like that time when we're going to change. And if there's one thing we know is that actually, you know, there, there are possibilities and pathways. Just the fact that RCP 2.6, the lowest, the less than two degree scenario exists, tells us that there are technical possibilities for this. And roadmaps exist, but what we don't know is exactly where those roadmaps are going. What, you know, how do we actually get on them? And is a roadmap actually the ideal metaphor when we're actually trying to move away from I don't know how many of you followed the Global Carbon Report announcement this week in Bonn about fossil fuel burning hits a record high in 2017 with an increase of about 2%. Um, and when we see those estimates and we see what we have to do to avoid dangerous climate change, you see it's almost like jumping off a cliff. It's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a radical transformation over the next um, decades. So as a social scientist, as someone interested in how do we actually motivate and actualize these changes, I'm very interested in this concept of um, transformations. But many people are saying, like, oh, we can't do it. Game over. We need to adapt. And this idea that we have, of course we have to adapt to some of these changes, but my research right now is really looking at, you know, what, what do we mean by successful adaptation to climate change? 
And the hypothesis that I'm exploring is that the only successful adaptation will happen through transformation. So my project is called Adaptation Connects, and it stands for combining old and new knowledge to enable conscious transformations to sustainability. So the idea is not that we just adapt to a two degree, three degree, four degree world, but that we actually adapt to the idea that we are changing the climate, that we can actually do something about it. And this is really big because climate change is showing us that we can change big systems. And that means that we can change systems, economic systems, political systems, you know, a lot of these different systems. So I'm looking at the conditions that create the, um, you know, the, make transformations possible, such as creativity, collaboration, empowerment, and flexibility. And um, through projects such as Art Connects, looking at science art interfaces, and Education Connects, how do we empower young people, not just to reduce their own little carbon emissions as consumers, but to actually engage in politics, to work with, you know, to become global citizens. Travel Connects is about the narratives in the Arctic, as the Arctic changes, how are we changing the stories we tell ourselves? And tell others, and how do those narratives themselves travel um, across the And Coffee Connects, um, I think everybody in the room probably loves coffee, and I'm the only one who doesn't drink coffee, but I have two PhD students studying you know, how from the farmers in Burundi and Guatemala to the roasters, to the baristas, to the consumers, how do we actually <coughs> adapt the entire value chain to the changing climate so that we actually reduce uh, vulnerability. So the underlying question I'm asking is, how do we transform at the scope, scale, speed, and depth that is called for by the global change research? And if it were just a climate change problem, it would probably be very easy, but it's not just climate change. Um, many of you have probably read about the plastics in the ocean, um, the, the nitrogen cycle, the um, phosphorus cycle, biodiversity loss, land use change, ozone depletion, ocean acidification, all of these issues come together and they interact with social equity, gender equity, voice, jobs, education, income, food, all of these issues. So it becomes one big problem that we are trying to change and that's where I want to look at how, what are our entry points for dealing with climate change um, as a way to look at um, larger change. So the research, the literature I look at doesn't come from the IPCC report. It doesn't focus necessarily on climate. It focuses on change. So I'm very interested, and I've been kind of a change junkie over the years, looking at like, okay, how do we change? How do we not, why do we not change? Um, what are the social theories we have of change? How do people go through these changes personally? What are the politics of change? And you know, what does it take to actually create this critical mass of change? So this really inspires me to just start thinking, you know, pulling in a wide range of, um, of literature to really interrogate how do we change. And one of the books that I found, of course, this title attracted me, Tools and Tactics for Changing Your Organization in the World. And I was like, it's in the, from the Harvard Business School. So, okay, yeah, great. And um, the more, when I read it, though, they make a really important distinction that I think applies very closely to climate change. And they say that there are technical problems that can be diagnosed and solved with existing um, and established knowledge, know-how, and expertise. So we need better management, more investment, more research, more, you know, more, more, more of everything to actually uh, deal with this. But they make the distinction between technical problems and adaptive problems or adaptive challenges, which really involve mindsets. They draw attention to the beliefs, the values, the worldviews that we take with us when we deal with a technical problem. Often it's not that hard to, you know, to pick, come up with technical solutions, but to organize at a massive scale society to move to renewable energies, to change the way our, you know, our social practices and things, that's often as much about our cultural habits and our, um, our world use of things. And so um, working with the Working Group 3 in the IPCC, I really started to see that like, the mitigation pathways that they were describing were very much about these technological and behavioral changes and um, arguing that a lot of these um, you know, the scenarios and the lines that we're seeing are very much about the technical problem of how do we change people and how do we change um, energy systems and agricultural systems. And much of it is based on what's referred to as the Kaya identity. And the Kaya identity is, you know, goes into the integrated assessment models and it looks at um, human activities um, in relationships to carbon dioxide as a function of population, GDP, energy efficiency of um, economic growth, and CO2 emissions 
per unit of energy. And when you read these articles, they don't have climate policy, they don't have social movements, they don't have you know power politics and people in them and those changes. And often they say like, and oh, this assumes that there's no additional policies in place uh, over the next 20 or 30 years. So my question then is, are we treating climate change just as a technical problem? Are we leaving people out of it? And um, in some ways, I think um, I would argue that we are. And we're addressing climate change as if it's only just a technical problem, which always leads to failure because you're not getting at the root, um, you know, the causes of why we can't agree and collaborate. And in this case, we're actually just taking the deck chairs and we're just painting them green and having them go like, okay, yes, we're you know heading in the same direction, but feeling really good about it. And I say that coming from Oslo, Norway, where we have a lot of really ambitious plans, but we're also, you know, looking for oil, the next um, oil thing. So there's a lot of contradictions here. So how do we identify an adaptive challenge? And I can translate uh, what the authors Heifetz and um, his colleagues um, refer to, and, and I think it relates very well to climate change. <coughs> says there's a, they say that there's a persistent gap between our aspirations and reality. And if there's any problem where this is true, I think it's climate change, where we see the record shattered every year, where we, where we see like what we want to do, and what we are doing, is um, you know why just you know amazingly wide, so I don't really need to spend more time on that, the news this week about this carbon budget evidence. But with adaptive challenges, you also have comp um, difficult learning. And these aren't just like complicated problems, they're not just complex problems, they're hyper-complex problems. And a hyper-complex problem is one that has dynamic complexity because what, have, what you do here actually has impacts somewhere else it's in, in another um, place in time. So there's a lag between our actions and the outcomes that we'll see. And that goes for mitigation as well. We reduce here and it's going to take a while to actually stabilize. To on there. Campus. But there's also yeah, social complexity the... linked to a diversity of stakeholders and um, people who have different values, different interests, and not everybody really cares about climate change or the future. Um, and so they see so the problem and solutions quite differently. And that's where we tend to get stuck. There's also emergent complexity because these are nonlinear processes, and I think the work on tipping points um, really alludes to this, that, you know, that small changes can have a really big outcome, and there's going to be a lot of surprises that we didn't expect. And while complexity science is what, yes, we're dealing with this, there's also human complexity about our cognition, perception, emotions, identities, and all the influences that influence the way that we see the problem and the way that we actually address them. I'm going to talk more about these, um, the human complexity uh, in a bit. Another aspect <coughs> of um, adaptive challenges is that new stakeholders um, have to be brought into the picture and engaged. And this is just a picture from a Wikipedia thing that's you know, saying that we need more than just experts and scientists, more than just policymakers. We need to bring in the artists, we need the religious leaders, we need um, you know, sports figures, we need everyone. And, and I think this is where we are actually doing better. Um, Future Earth, um, the Global Change Research Project organized um, to address you know, solutions-oriented science, is really engaging with society. It has a, you know, a really strong engagement aspect and these knowledge action networks are trying to do science in a new way, integrated research, bringing together all these different types of things. So there, I think, is some positive. Um, Adaptive challenges also um, are characterized when um, disequilibrium is experienced as a sense of crisis is starting to be felt. And, um, and I think this is becoming more and more visible. And I see that even myself, my mother lives in Florida, and as I watched the, the storm path kind of go right towards Sarasota, I was like, oh, you know, like it, it really had this sense of, wow, you know, the crisis it hits home. And, and I used to always say to my students, you know, do we have to wait till we see, you know, your grandmother floating down the river? And, and that was a very, you know, like, awesome to hear. <laughs> but she was fine. <laughs> um, and this one I just added to theirs because it's often an adaptive challenge when you just think that it's everybody else who needs to change, you know, that it's like, we're going to be fine, but it's them or it's the others. And um, I see this a lot in Norway because the Meteorological Institute will inform us that we're going to have higher temperatures, more rain, shorter snow seasons, higher sea levels, and increased runoff. And a lot of people will go, four degrees, yeah, <laughs> shorts, you know, this is going to be great. And, um, and that kind of thing is, you know, it's, it's really not 
based on a system's understanding and not based on a realistic understanding of what climate change means for Norway. And we've had enormous damages from flooding and storms and things. And I think that um, you know, the, the people are really starting to realize that agriculture, everything is not well adapted for the environmental world. So how do we resist adaptive challenges? Well, because we do. <coughs> adaptive challenges make us uncomfortable. So often we divert attention to other things, um, you know, like sports events or you know, entertainment, anything that will kind of get us away from looking at the news. And I was telling students before that I don't get invited to many parties anymore because of the people she's just going to talk about climate change. And that's not what people want to talk about on a Friday night. So you know, yeah, we divert our attention, but we also displace our responsibility on others, you know, it's the oil companies, it's the whatever, it's, it's always someone else rather than ourselves that do this. And how do we resist adaptive challenges? Like why, you know, is it, and I show this because I think this, I, I see this relates very well to me, that we have a productive range of distress that we can handle, where we can actually, you know, handle a problem with this and we're working on things, but if it becomes too much beyond our limit of tolerance, we just drop out and treat it as a technical problem or, avoid it. And often when I'm lecturing to students and I'm telling them about climate change and, and they're getting very interested and I'll go on about ocean acidification and biodiversity loss and I just see them just kind of go whoop. They get on their phones and then they just don't come back. And so you have learned to try to recognizing that that productive range of distress also varies. You know, depending on what's going on in your life, if you're tired, if you just lost your job or something like that, you can't. So you have to really, you know, in our messaging, you know, think about where people are at in their, um, you know, how much can they actually handle it and work with productive uh, challenges. So adaptive challenges are personal because they involve questioning our individual and shared beliefs about the way that the world works, about how we relate to each other, how we relate to the future, and then also challenging dominant paradigms. And I'll go into the whole ideas of transformation in a minute. But it's not, adaptive challenges are not just personal, they're very much political as well, because they really involve challenging what we collectively have decided on as given, you know, like capitalism is given, and the future is given, and this is what, you know, all of these things that may or may not be true, but they're not given, you know, they're, they're actually produced by, um, you know, by, by societies, by interests, etc. So they, quest, they involve questioning who decides, whose values count, and it's not just critiquing them, but also launching the alternatives. You know, how do we get to not just the green trans um, transitions, but also social transformations that address many of the underlying roots of these um, problems. So that brings us then to the idea of adaptive challenges are really about social <coughs> transformations. Um, so some of the questions I think that we have to think about then is how do we transform in ways that are equitable, ethical, and sustainable, rather than just top-down um, order of transformation. And this raises questions about what is the relationship between individual change, when I change, collective change, when we change, and systems change when the larger systems change. And as, because, as it involves people, it obviously involves power, politics, and human agency. So where do these fit into our understandings of social change? Um, Transformation is kind of a tough word. It doesn't translate very well into all languages. And within the IPCC, there were many countries that just didn't even want to include this in working group two. So it became a highly political issue. Because they said, you know what? We've been transformed before. We don't want your green economy, green growth, whatever, whatever. Let us decide what transformation is. So we spent five days discussing the definition of transformation. And putting a little footnote, it means whatever what people want it to mean. <laughs> so it's kind of what the definition is summary for policymakers, but but what I think of it as is physical and or qualitative changes in form, structure, or meaning making. And it's very much typified by the caterpillar going to the butterfly because it changes its form from caterpillar to butterfly. It changes the structure of its cells, you know, completely like dissolves and turns into something else. But also that meaning making of a caterpillar and a butterfly see very different worlds. You know, and one is not better than the other, but they just have very different and that kind of captures what, um, what we're talking about with transformations. Now, how do we, I mean, there's lots of different social theories of transformations, multi-level perspectives, social practice theory, um, you know, the list goes on and on. And I, um, a few years ago, I, I just read something by um, uh, someone who worked at the United Nations, 
leading, working with uh, leadership and capacity building and really scaling out the HIV AIDS program. And um, the thing was on from personal to planetary transformation. So I contacted her and started working with her on these three spheres of transformation to really see you know, how do we transform um, collectively. And I'm just going to walk you through these three spheres just as a heuristic device to think about the different ways that um, all of these work together collectively all the time. And it's not to say that you're working in just one sphere, but it's, it's really, you know, these are interacting. And the core sphere is the practical sphere, and this is very much where we are focused probably 90% of our attention. Most of the Millennium Development Goals are very practical, they're the measurable outcomes, that's where we, we're, you know, where the victory <coughs> is, and it's, you know, it's really the bullseye. And these are the changes in the techni uh, you know, technical changes and behavioral changes that we can measure and we can move. So it's more solar panels, more people on bicycles, um, it's more you know, education for girls, um, less meat consumption. You know, all of the things that you read about as what to do about climate change are very much in that practical sphere. And, we, and that's where we have a lot of the solutions and we're yeah, that's great. But it's not happening fast enough, you know? Those curves are not moving, they're not interesting. And so what is it that is keeping us from actually getting to those very practical solutions that the IPCC <laughs> says that we actually have, we don't actually need new technologies that we could reduce greenhouse gas emissions where we're at. And that's because what I would call the political sphere, these are the systems and the structures, the cultures, the things that we have actually created our society around that either facilitate those practical changes, like providing incentives and laws and new rules and norms and things, or they, um, they stop them from happening, exactly because the incentive, perverse incentives, we're still investing in oil, our financial systems are still tied to the price of oil, there's all sorts of feedbacks <coughs> and things that are actually making it nonsensical to actually you know, commit to um, you know, the, the changes in the practical sphere. And you start to see these and you see that like, you know, the, I just read that like the Swiss um, reinsurance companies and the Swiss pension fund is actually investing still in a four degree warmer world or six degree warmer world at the same time they're realizing that, you know, they can't reinsure those types of capacities. So you know, why is this the political sphere? And I, I call it the political sphere because it really is where the collective has to decide. These are where this, you know, system, you know, it's systems and structures are formed by people, and even, you know, the, our social ecological systems, water systems, water management systems, agricultural systems, and things, they really are about the decisions, and that's where we also get conflicts. We get people who, you know, some people want this, some people want that. The entire um, international negotiations on climate change was really stuck in the political sphere, trying to come up with an, 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 a system everyone could agree on for emissions reductions, and it turned out to be voluntary. So we get the conflicts in that political sphere, we get cooperation and collaboration in the political sphere as well. And, um, and you get resistance to change in that, uh, in that sphere. Sometimes it's cultural, sometimes um, it's political, but often when someone, has, when someone has this great idea, and I think everybody sees that, whether it's at a university or in your workplace or something, good ideas often, you know, systems resist change, they fight back, they, you know, they don't take on a life of their own. And so we can often get stuck in that political sphere because we're not paying much attention to the personal sphere. And when I say personal sphere, I mean the individual and shared beliefs, values, worldviews, and paradigms. It's not just what I have alone, but they're influenced by our cultures. They're influenced by what our neighbors think about, what others think about. And these beliefs, values, and worldviews influence then you know, how we see the system. How do we see ourselves in relation to the system and to others. How do we, um, you know, do we actually think that you know, we lead change, are we responsible for it? All of these things, you know, basically our whole like cosmology, our ontology, our, I mean, these, these influence then what our priorities will be in, you know, for the <coughs> economic growth versus sustainable development, um, or such. And they play out then in the practical sphere because that's very much where we're putting our money and, you know, our resources and things like that. And, Whenever I show this, people are like, ah, oh, yes, we've got to change everybody's beliefs, values, and worldviews. I mean, that's, the, that's the key. And that's really like taking it and putting it right in the practical sphere and just being like, oh, we're just going to change people, you know? And, you know, if anyone in this room has ever had success in changing somebody, you know, like willingly, it, it usually doesn't work. You usually get, like, backlash. And we've tried that through indoctrination, and it's been very oppressive to try to, like, make people change. So, a lot of the, you know, the point here is to really recognize
recognizing that in that political <coughs> we're dealing with different belief values, worldviews, um, and competing paradigms. And I'm going to just kind of walk you through some of this. But in some ways, the outcomes for sustainability, you know, when we change the way we see the system, the system will change. And very much um, in the end, the outcomes are the system. actually map quite well on them because she talks about constants, parameters, and numbers, you know, the tax rates, the um, you know, interest rates, all those things, as being a very low leverage point where we put 99% of our energy and we're often pushing the system in the wrong direction um, with those. And um, for a number of reasons, and the size of buffers, it's really hard to change those. They don't have a lot of leverage because you know, they're beyond a lot of our control. Much of the political sphere is in relation to systems and feedbacks and um, you know, the, the structure of information flows, the rule of the system, and also you know, who has the power to influence those rules of the system. So you see that when we get into that political sphere, there's a lot more leverage, and, uh, and that's why politics is so important about this, but also getting engaged um, you know, just in any system of change. And what she calls the highest leverage points really, I think, fall well in her personal sphere. You know, the goal of the system. Once you change that, then whoop, all the other things change um, automatically, by logic, because you start to you know, prioritize different goals. And so when we say that you know, we have these sustainable development goals, um, yes, we do, but we still have economic growth as a, and jobs and all these other competing commitments that are, are leading to problems in our political sphere. But she talks about mindsets or paradigms uh, from which the system arises as being one of the highest, and the power to transcend paradigms as an even higher one. And when I'm thinking about social transformations and I'm thinking about bending those curves really rapidly, I'm thinking that we why waste time on the lower leverage points? Let's start looking at the highest leverage points for a system to change. Looking at values. Um, you know, we hear a lot about values and values and values, a lot of rhetoric. This is um, Shalom Schwartz's structure of value systems. And you see nine universal values that are expressed differently by different cultures with different motivations, such as self-enhancement, self-transcendence, openness to change, or um, conservation. And, um, and I think we often fail to recognize that, you know, we, we, we express all of these values in different times and different situations. And, but they really play out very much in that political sphere. And he points out that it's the different motivations, so it's the opposite values where you often get the conflicts, you know, the conservation versus openness to change, or self-enhancement versus self-transcendence. And these are the things where when we surface the values, we see that a lot of the issues around climate change really are value conflicts, at least in Norway, where um, you know, we're looking at oil for the future of oil. And right today, um, some environmental groups are actually using the Constitution and suing the government for breaking the Constitution in terms of natural resources, you know, preserving our natural resources. So using that political system to actually express the values that we have. Um, Worldviews are also important. Worldviews are more than values, they're more than what we can cognitively perceive, but they're also about ourselves. Who am I? Um, what am I aware of? What's significant to me? What should I do? How should we interact? What do I need? All of these deeper human dimensions, and this gets into that human complexity that I talked about. What's attractive to me? Um, even relational, where am I drawing the line between myself and others, or you know, us and um, them, et cetera? And then finally, you have deeper questions of what is of ultimate concern. And all of these then give us our worldview. And we're all on the same mountain, but we're all looking at it from a different perspective, you know? Some people may have this big, broad worldview of interacting with socio-ecological systems, and some may have a really you know, clear view of the, the you know, of, uh, little patch of ice right in front of them. So we're looking at the world in different ways through different lenses, with different filters, and we're trying to describe that world and do something about that world. And I think the, you know, the changes are really, um, you know, we often get stuck in that political sphere. And that brings us then to the beliefs that often underlie our worldviews. And a belief is an acceptance that something exists or is true, especially without proof. And so we talk about, do you believe in climate change? Do you not believe in climate change? Rather than, how do you understand change? How do you understand our relationship to the climate system? And a lot of the psychology literature on climate change shows that we, you know, there's a tendency not just to um, believe what we see, but to see what we believe. And I'm going to give you a good example from 
um, that you might have seen on Facebook. This went around. Um, uh, um, a group was, you know, fascinated by this picture, actually from Oslo, and um, you know, spreading it 40, um, 54 times or, or more and everything. But um, it came in the news that it was an anti-immigrant group mistook empty bus seats for women wearing burqas, and so they, um, you know, they they were looking at these and then calling all these comments and we've got to get these people out of the country and there were just empty bus seats. So, um, <laughs> so this was like, a, I think, a really good example of our capacity to misinterpret data that is coming into us based on what we believe and what we see. And so we tend to find the evidence to support our beliefs and seldom do we actually challenge the underlying assumptions or, you know, or question ourselves about what is possible. So this brings me then to the question that I pose in the title of, you know, limiting climate change to 1.5 degrees. And how many of you here think it is possible? Okay. It's <laughs> possible. It's very, 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 very possible. Yeah, yeah. So this is a question about possibility, not probability. So that's a really good point. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, so it's probably in, it's improbable, but it's maybe not possible. We don't know. I don't know how many of you have read Paul Hopkins' new um, drawdown on you know reversing global warming and is you know, saying that's possible. So you know, a lot of things. But a lot of times when you hear a question like that, you get a lot of things popping up in your head like, ah, it's already too late. We should have done this 30 years ago. You know, we should have. You know, we're just you know we're we're just late. You know, <coughs> game over. <coughs> we might have some assumptions about people. People will never change. And sometimes our um, our sample size is very like, limited. Has not changed ever, so why would anybody change? Or you know, you, you pick, you selectively pick that like people will never change without seeing that there are people changing all the time. You know that kind of thing. You might say that like well, oil companies have all the power. You know, the Secretary of State in the United States was the head of Exxon. How would we ever change a system where um, you know oil is um, you know, oil still is king? Um, for those working in the science of climate change, you might just say the models say that it's impossible and the models are off -ball. you know, they're always right. Mm -hmm. And you can look at the past and you can say that, like, oh, you know, they've actually done a good job predicting them, but now the models are going to be right and, yeah, sorry. Um, some people will say, well, God has already decided the future. You know, there is no free will anyway and we can't uh, do anything about it. And so, um, and it's kind of like, we call them neo-skeptics, people that are just kind of saying, like, yeah, this is it, the end, and we were never meant to be on the planet for that long, and, you know, this is time is up, um, and everything. And that's a, a different type of um, skepticism. And then there's people that are saying, oh, it's all just natural variability. You know, this isn't climate change anyway, it's all a social construction or uh, whatever, climate hoax and things. So, so there's many different perspectives that can underlie why people believe or do not believe that we can limit climate change to 1.5 degrees. <coughs> and the question here is, you know, whether we can limit it as a possibility rather than as a probability. Because if you look at the probabilities, you get those stories of, say, 5% chance of reaching 2 degrees. And if you saw that headline and just go, oh, can't do it. If you read the actual paper, it does not include climate policy. And it goes back to that Kaya identity and it goes back to the assumptions about what we do. Oh, I forgot the last one. We don't actually need to limit it to 1.5. We can adapt to anything. We've always adapted. We're still here as people. And, and I think that that like, adaptation is, um, very, you know, is a very positive thing. Of course we have to adapt to some change. And of course it's going to Money, of course, there are, but there are limits to adaptation, and some of those limits are very physical, based on you know how much temperature we call our bodies can actually you know take and you know, you know, they dissipate heat from. Um, <coughs> some of them are um, just based on culture and what is of value to us. Um, I have one son who is just an avid skier, and the idea of no snow in Norway is just like it's non-negotiable. Like, oh, the, the, the ski company is very interested in this. Making snow, saving snow, and everything. But, but I think for you know, in many places, that idea for Norwegians, winter sports, is part of the national identity. So how do you actually deal, um, you know, adapt to those um, things? And one of the reasons why I got, became skeptical of my own research on adaptation was reading Paulo Freire's *The Pedagogy of the Oppressed*, um, which was written in 1970 about our education systems, about uh, just filling people with facts and things versus getting them to question it. And he said, the well-adapted individual suits the oppressor's needs, but the 
well fitted for the world, and so the oppressors can keep going on. And I think of it as like the well-adapted individual suits the polluters' needs because we just keep going on. I keep flying around the world. Norway is getting up oil, and I'm telling farmers in El Salvador that they need to keep adapting. And so there's something then that's like, wow, maybe the transformation has to happen elsewhere. So one of my questions is, what are the beliefs and assumptions underlying our current understanding of social change are actually wrong? And this is one of these, um, you know, the challenges of like, trying to think through what, you know, what might we be missing? What's off our radar? Where are, what are my blind spots? You know, where, where am I filtering out information? Um, and this is where we come to that high leverage point of paradigms. And um, if we think about, you know, like the paradigm that modernity has been based on and built on, it really is the Enlightenment paradigm. And how does the Enlightenment look at human beings? Well, it sees humans as completely material, and mental states are nothing than these little, like, flashes going on in our brain between our neurons. In other words, consciousness is just an illusion. It doesn't actually exist. that phenomena that isn't part of um, our real experience. And there's no role for experience, meaning, or purpose, which depends on consciousness. And there's also no free will. So going back to that, we have a choice about the future. And, you know, there's many people who, philosophers, who say, no, we actually have no free will. Um, choice is an illusion. And there are other paradigms. Um, Andreas Weber um, has been arguing for an enlivenment paradigm and a lot of the environmental humanities and new materialism and things. A cultural worldview that emphasizes the importance of lived experience, embodied meaning, material exchange and subjectivity. And we haven't modeled those in our, um, you know, it's like our, most of our models are coming from a very enlightened paradigm of treating people as um, these, um, yeah, basically um, things that don't have free choice. Um, so I've been very interested then in, you know, so what, what is the, what, what is science really telling us? The science is changing so quickly. And when you look, you know, it's the 100th anniversary of quantum physics um, 15 years ago, and quantum mechanics forced <coughs> physicists to reshape their ideas of reality, to rethink the nature of things at the deepest level, and to revise their concepts of position and speed, as well as notions of cause and effect. And this is all at the subatomic level. So we're going like at the subatomic level, we have no idea, you know, what the world is about. And in fact, most physicists actually believe that we may live in like multiple universes where in one universe I drop this and another I don't. And you know, there are so many, or we live in a quantum hologram, or all of these big things, but the meaning of quantum physics is very much in question. Um, but interestingly, you know, if the fact that quantum physics was developed, social scientists were also following it and looking at it. Um, and um, it just never you know, really completely developed. But I've been looking into some of the work on like, quantum social science, um, where people are using just the mathematics from it to look at quantum decision making here at Ohio State University. There's a, a group working on that um, very well. So quantum, you know, just as a mathematical factor, and I realize that the method I use, the Q methodology, is actually based on quantum. It's looking at discourses and how they are actually influenced in the moment. And so quantum game theory, all of these things are just really using quantum mathematics to actually predict human behavior and the dynamics and things. Um, Karen Barad's work, Meeting the Universe Halfway, is you know, she's a physicist and a feminist, and she's looking at what she calls agential realism, on like where we make, make the cut between us and something else, and that we are actually you know, constantly interacting with our environment rather than being separate from it, so that through our everyday actions and the meanings we give them, we are actually creating that. And what I find most challenging is Alexander Weck's Quantum Mind and Social Science. And he's in this building, you know, which I think is actually very, um, like, that he's here in Derby, he has his office in Derby Hall. And, and I contacted him when I read about, um, like, his work a few years ago. He said, what does this mean for climate change? And he kind of was very, you know, paused in his email. <laughs> Um, and he's like, well, I think I'm going to get that we are more like a quantum social organism entangled through language and through meaning that is out there. And, you know, as we, and I think that idea that, that in consciousness we would be entangled, but it is through the way you know, the words we speak, the, you know, how, how our narratives are actually you know, connect, connecting with others. So I'm really interested in looking then at the mathematical, the uh, metaphorical, and the meaningful significance of these types of paradigm shifts and what do they mean um, 
And Alex argues um, quite provocatively that if human beings really are quantum, then classical social science is essentially founded on a mistake, and social life will therefore require a quantum framework for its proper understanding. And I know many of the critical social scientists are like, we don't need physics to actually you know, like justify um, our interpretivist uh, versions of things. But coming from working with the IPCC, where you see these class, you know, the, the very classical social science being very much um, institutionalized in the models and things, I think, well, if you understand power and politics in science, it's actually good to just play with you know, a different lens for a while and see what that might give us as an idea. And so one area that my research is looking at is um, graduate students is, is collaborative power. And collaborative power has been defined by Anne Marie Slaughter as the power of many to do together what no one can do alone. And she was writing this in response to the um, Arab Spring, you know, how these big changes just kind of happened and changed. And so, you know, I'm trying to think then what does a classic paradigm of collaboration look like versus maybe a more quantum one. And in the classic paradigm, we are these individual marbles bumping up against each other, coming together, rolling together, hitting together, um, arguing, breaking each other, whatever, in that. In the quantum paradigm, paradigm, we are both and. We are waves and particles in that we are you know, individuals, but we are also relational beings that are interacting, again, through language, through meaning, through our exchanges, through just the, you know, perceived information we give information, energy, et cetera. So, if we're looking at collaboration in a traditional definition of the personal organization, organizational and cultural skills are traits conducive to joining individuals together to tackle problems. This is really kind of the way we're doing it through this mechanical thing, like, come on, people, let's work together. And, and I see that in, you know, universities, we're trying to do interdisciplinary work, and we're really struggling to, <coughs> to speak the same language and, and, and connect. In this, in organizations, you know, like, and even cities also has these fantastic goals to reduce emissions by 50% by 2020, and I think like 90% by 2030. And we're getting, you know, like people marching and picketing because they're getting their parking spaces taken. <coughs> it, like it becomes then, you know, how do you collaborate with people rather than, you know, having this uh, conflict in the sphere? <coughs> and this idea of the entanglement of a large number of atoms is from um, MIT, uh, a scientific study, but metaphorically, if we start to think of ourselves as connected, um, and we see that you know every day that you know, people are working together and are mutually entangled, um, and we think, well, how you know, that does change the way we can collaborate. Um, if we look at just some of the research that comes out on social networks um, and connected, um, the amazing power of so social networks and how they shape our lives. Um, Christophus and Fowler look at that, the role of all these individuals, and they conclude in the end that like, we don't really have a good model for individual and collective change. We need to actually rethink that because of all these, you know, there are you know, parts, all these different friendship networks and heart and health um, networks and things. And like, wow, something's going on that is actually connecting us in a different way. And in this model, um, model simulation on the right, um, it's an agent-based modeling experiment um, on social consensus through the influence of committed minorities. And in that small print it says, in this visualization, we see the tipping point where minority opinion, shown in red, quickly becomes majority opinion. Over time, the minority opinion grows. Once the minority opinion reached 10% of the population, the network quickly changed as minority opinion um, takes on the original majority. So that doesn't actually mean that opinion, opinion can change one way or another, as you see in the United States. It's, um, uh, but that idea that it doesn't take 51% or 100% to be in agreement, that we don't need everybody to say like, oh, yes, we are. climate change is the most important issue I'm going to deal with. But we need people who can engage with systems change, who can be active in that political sphere, working on the systems and structure, working on whatever sphere of influence they are, actually can be um, engaged with. And so that means like when we're moving from this technical problem that is very much about um, you know, the, you know, getting everything right and trying to, you know, the carbon roadmaps and you know, the, the technical responses that we actually know we can do, it's really about engaging people with the problem. And not just everybody, but really connecting to people. And that's why I think that you know, we're actually overlooking the most powerful solution to climate change that exists, and that really is people. And that is people and their energy to actually collaborate based on their values. And most people have 
values that you know values that apply to everyone, such as equity, dignity, compassion. Those are the things that um, Monica Sharma has found in her work in over 30 years of working with female genital mutilation and sex trafficking of children and all these kind of UNDP projects. That when you start from that personal sphere and stand for certain values and see what systems actually need to shift to actually create measurable results, that you you know you find that you can actually activate people. So. What I think you know our, our challenge then is to really start to see not just that like you know, to see that all three spheres interacting and co-arising at the same time rather than saying like, oh we just have to sit and practice oh we just have to work in a <coughs> oh we just have to work in a sit and meditate or something because it's all really about you know that our our politics are influenced by our you know, worldviews and our practical results are also influenced by our politics so um so. At the end of the day, uh, what I'd like to leave you is that you know climate change is much more than a CO2 problem. Yes, it is a CO2 problem, and yes, it's something that you know we, we need to change, bend those emission curves. But if we only deal with the CO2 part of it, we're going to actually miss a lot of different um, you know like changes that will backfire. And again, it will be like shifting the deck chair on the Titanic. Instead, I think we should be looking at this as like a relationship problem. You know, a relationship between ourselves and nature, ourselves and others, ourselves and ourselves, and ourselves and change in general. And so, you know, whether 1.5 is possible, you know, becomes this question of what do I actually see? And why I think that we should be looking at paradigms is because, um, you know, like we're often what's possible really depends on your perspective. And, um, and so if we can actually change our perspective. So they're saying, like, change the way you look at things and the things you look at will change. And I think that um, at this point, we actually need to be thinking very much on those higher leverage points um, and you know, bringing the personal and the political to the right practical solutions. So thank you so much for listening to me, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions.
know, it became it became a very um, like a different type of thing because of those politics. So so transformation, you know, is not always desirable, and I think that's really what we're talking about with climate change are enormous transformations due to the impacts of climate change. Um, and enormous transformations that are going to happen one way or another, and it's really about what type can we do and can we actually think through these very clearly. Because, um, yeah, people don't want to be transformed, and transformation also challenges vested interests, it challenges, you know, like, even, you know, it's not just the elites, but, you know, it, we, we like stability. Not everything needs to be transformed. We want some things to actually be reliable, predictable, and functioning. So, so it's a very human thing to kind of go like, no, don't transform everything. And so, so I think that that kind of, um, a little bit of like humility in, in that understanding that there are different views on that, that it's not to be talking about these big transformations. You know, sometimes that's where the qualitative changes come in, transform our yeah. I'm interested in your productive range of distress. Um, I've heard about this before from a group called the Climate Advocacy Lab, which mm -hmm. says, you know, essentially if you terrify people, they'll just give up. Um, but it also sounds rather like um, Shikset Mihaly's concept of flow in psychology between, you know, there's a midpoint between boredom and anxiety at which you are engaged and productive. And I wonder if you have examples of um, ways of pitching solutions that have sort of gotten to that sweet spot, um, by either by downscaling a problem or by, you know, presenting it optimistically, or what do you, what do, you do to sort of hit that productive level of distress? Yeah. I think there, I mean, there's a lot of research on climate communication, and, um, and that's not my area of expertise. And I think that high business, I think it's really important. But I think some of it is a little bit intuitive and being, uh, you know, kind of aware and in the moment. But it's also being, you know, like sometimes you have to stretch. And I was giving a talk to 19 year olds about climate change for an NGO, and and I, you know, I was like, and last week the sea level rise, you know, three studies showed that sea level rise could be double, and you know, this and that. And, and she was like, wait, 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 don't let her depress you, you know. We're doing things and everything, and one of the teachers was like, "No, we actually need to hear that so that we, you know." So, but it's a little bit like that. Maybe for some people it was too much, but maybe for others it was like. So there's that fine line, and I think you have to just intuit into your audiences and things, and be really be kind of aware and ready to, you know, like stop where you know where you can just sense it. Because I don't think there's any single recipe that that works, but it's really like, um, and, and it raises that question of, you know, to what it, like. Is optimism just you know false? Oh, you need to give people hope and false optimism versus realism. You know, this is where we are we are at in 2017, and help people to understand that you know like one and a half degrees is very different than three degrees. You know that these every little you know this is nonlinear changes, and and that you know like yes you know we are going to have losses and things, but we can do so much better. And so you know whether it's 30 centimeters of sea level rise or 1.5 meters is an enormous difference for people, you know, in coastal areas. And so it brings it back to, you know, some people thinking that people are expendable, oh, who cares? And reading in the New York Times that a mining executive in Greenland says, I don't care if the whole Greenland ice sheet melts, it will reveal some very interesting geology. And we just go, wow, you know, that, you don't decide the future, I decide the future. Because, you know, then that goes into human security. How are you, you know, a future for whom? And you know, can we think about the largest possible, you know, we? So it's a, I think it's a good question, though, for our, all of us to think about. When you were talking about a quantum basis, mm -hmm. or you showed the slide from MIT, mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned that there are things that are going on now in the political sphere and the social sphere that are sort of occurring on a different basis. Mm -hmm. but, and I thought of intersectionality, and that's a, like a political concept. Mm -hmm. Um, then the question comes up, uh, how do you get from um, the, the discussion of intersectionality on Twitter and Facebook mm -hmm. and, and an understanding of that concept to the bigger consideration that this is somehow connected to climate change? Mm -hmm. what, what, is it the role of teachers? Is it the role of journalists? Am I understanding correctly that you said we have to pay attention, we have to notice? areas where there are these fundamental 
would be different ways of looking at reality already. Yeah. How do we draw the connection? Yeah. What's the mechanism for making the yeah. connection? I think education is really important. It's how we educate people. And Alex Munn would say that if we're educating people from you know, like age five up in a very classical worldview, you're going to get them to be seeing the world in a certain way versus if we get them to be seeing, you know, like just challenging identities, seeing multiple identities, intersectionality, you know, all that. It's, uh, you know, like that. that's how we do it. Don't need that personal experience. It's always social change. It's, you know, people rising up for, um, you know, against slavery and all this stuff. But it's always some groups that just said, wait a minute, why are we having slaves? Why are doctors not washing their hands before delivering babies? Why are people smoking on airplanes? And that was the flight attendants who were actually then organizing and things. So you have to start to challenge things and go, like, why do we need to work in this situation? Why do we need to do that? And then and then mobilizing and, and finding people. And you, I mean, when I was a teenager, you could drink and drive in the United States, you know? In the 70s, and things, and that People was just normal. Yeah. <laughs> you what? We must still do well. <laughs> Norway, whereas I'd ask for like a non alcoholic beer, and like, but we don't want what? Whereas in Norway, it's just like a zero tolerance, so it's, it's a different norm. But um, but then, you know, Mothers Against Strong Thriving, after, you know, they organized, and eventually they got it onto laws and rules, you know, I know it, and then in some countries, it's like a norm that you just don't do that. And and I think that that's how social change, if you think, like, Put yourself 50 years in the future, you know, thinking 50 years in the future, we will look back and go, oh my God, we burned fossil fuel for going from point A to point B when there were so many other energy sources. And when those fossil fuels are such valuable molecules, you know, I you know somebody who's working on creating a plasma that can actually serve as a battery for storing it. And he's from Alberta and he's like, wow, we could actually use the same infrastructure and use these as batteries and things. And I have an a geography book from um, 1898 that was talking about oil in North America, and and they're like, oh, you know, first we didn't know what to do with it, so it just was spouting off the ground and things like that, and then we figured it can replace kerosene, and now we have a hundred uses for it and everything. And it was like that they couldn't even anticipate plastics and all the things that we're doing with it now. We can't anticipate what else it would be used for, but we're just burning it, you know, as a as a when, so so I think that um, you know, like, and I think some of like oil people are starting to think like that, of like maybe long-term thing. But one of the dangers, I think, you know, one of my biggest concerns is that if we just go this technical route and just normalize them, the, the technical solutions, without questioning the social, without questioning, you know, like the, the political and the personal aspects, the next thing that will be normalized will be geoengineering. And geoengineering then will be just the logical next step to take, because of course we're never going to be able to bend those curves, which in them in the first place, and probably it will be like oil companies that happen to have the geoengineering <coughs> solutions that then, you know, humanity will rely on for the next 500 years and everything. And, it, and that, I think, is uh, an error, and if we're educating people, how do we educate them, you know, with that social perspective to say, wait a minute, you know, challenge the given, challenge the question, question your paradigm, and that idea, and I, I kind of, follow the, um, you know, what the findings in quantum physics and you just see that more and more it's like quantum biology and, you know, bird navigation and sense of smell and photosynthesis and it's, it's you know, really showing that these small changes can make a big difference, you know, like, we're, it's not just like below and above, it's, we are, um, it's, you know, it's, it's we're taking a very holistic um, perspective and whatever the real paradigm would be, you know, it's going to, you know, I don't know what's true or not true, but just the challenge in thinking, I think, is really important in, um, in physics and in social science. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I want to change your presentation and what to think about. Uh, but one of the, I think, frustrating things is the time needed for the transformation. So, the example you gave is, uh, I'm a, maybe a little older, but yeah, I remember people smoking on airplanes. Mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that. But it took a long time for those transformations to happen. And I guess the frustration from the climate scientist's point of view is since we don't have that, we don't have a great amount of time for the transformations to occur. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how we expedite that. And maybe you can speak to that. But, and also uh, the messaging. <coughs> I think for us as climate scientists, we have a lot of work to do on how we message and um, 
Do we go out and talk to people? What I think it's taken us at least a decade to realize is just giving them the nice to think, well, if I just give them enough data, just, you know, if I show enough graphs, mm -hmm. that, that maybe they'll get it. But it isn't that's insufficient. And it comes back to who's the messenger? Who's the messenger? How are they messaging? And are people, some people will listen to the message as a function of the messenger, but some will turn it off just like that. You know, if you're not from the right tribes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you just speak? Yeah, that I think frustration. No, because I, I felt that frustration. I think that like. Why, what I see is that like the climate scientists, we're just talking to people right here, you know, the very cognitive thing, and, and with the IPCC, we're going to have a sixth assessment report, you know, 7,000 more pages and graphs that are being color, and maybe we'll have some animated, you know, like that kind of communication. And Bill has a book here, um, The Great Derangement, and a lot of people, you know, like literature and art and things that gets to people's heart and gets to people, you know, to really feel and be kind of embodied. And I've had, you know, book my papers on people working with communities through dance that really releases a lot of emotions and she said more people came to talk about whether we should have a dam or not dam for flood control and things like that after that. And there are so many other ways of doing, you know, of, of communicating with people as people rather than as just, I think that cognitive information deficit model, you know, it, it, we can go on and on and on. And sometimes, um, you know, sometimes it's like who the messenger is. And some, I would get very frustrated when somebody who I've been telling about climate change for 20 years just comes back and is like, I went to a talk, and did you know that climate change is a real risk? And then you're like, oh, well, it's good that you heard that, and then thing. And then you just, you know, but everyone, you know, is kind of tuned in to different people, different, um, and then it gets to your question about time. And um, I think that's a little bit of a paradox, because transformation takes time, and transformation doesn't take time. You can have these aha moments. Thomas Kuhn says that, you know, or said back in 1962 that paradigm shift happens when scientists die and make room for others. And, and I actually see that with like the quantum stuff, I just get lots of emails from PhD students and postdocs and people are like, oh yeah, this is the way, you know, they're, they're kind of in that paradigm, you know, they're, they're really, really open to it. Way here. But when he was writing, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have these capacities to read a hundred papers in you know in a weekend or you know like go scroll through and find the information and see the information. And people are living longer. And what they're showing it used to be. I, I feel like I'm really like old. I said when I grew up, it was like the, the neuroscience was just saying that you know your brain cells just keep dying. You know, and then you're. you're you know, like every, you know, like every beer you drink, you come to, you know, like go downhill from there. As a 20 year old, you're like, wow, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> but when you, but the, um, like, psychology and learn, adult learning has shown that, you know, we're not, when, you know, we may be done, but we can actually change our meaning making. We can actually change the way that we see the world and go through shifts from the very socialized mind where we're just, like, you know, influenced by, um, you know, our peers and our society and things like that to the self-authoring mind where you can step out of your social ego, I decide. And of course that can be very dangerous too if you, you know, have a healthy ego and you end up president something like that. You know, I decide. But you can also then develop into like self-transforming mind where you can reflect on your own um, discourse or paradigm or something and like, oh there I go again being a da 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 da. And, and so, and we're always, to some extent, socialized in some situations we're self or, or um, offering. In some situations, we actually have that reflexivity <coughs> back. But that's something that is actually quite new to look at how adult learning has, you know, has changed. So people who can, you know, at any age suddenly have this, like, wow, I see the world differently. And that's where you know, education comes in that we want to, but also adult learning. You know, like, how do you message it to people? If you have, Norway, the grandparents against climate change and things, and people who, you know, maybe have spent years in industry, including things like that, but suddenly they have this, whoa, what have I been doing? And that I think is very promising too. So one of the books that I sh showed up there on immunity to change by um, Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy really look at, you know, he's one of the pioneers at Harvard in adult learning and how do we actually change the way that we you know, through that. And then, you know, so that actually challenges us to then think about how do we, you know, how do you actually create arenas where people can, you know, kind of get to that self-authoring. And, and one of the things that I've been doing um, 
with my students first, and now with the public, we're working on just like a public platform, is when my students didn't understand systems change, you know, climate change and everything, um, and the relationship between like, sorting your trash and how you can meet, riding a bicycle and all those things, which always are the solutions that are given by Al Gore or anything at the end of a you know, devastating talk about climate change. Well, you can ride your bicycle and everything. Rather than you can challenge your government for you know, uh, drilling for oil or you can challenge where your pension fund is being invested. You can challenge all these things. And so what I have the students do is um, make one small change for 30 days. And, um, and they make that one small, you know, they take anything. And, and, and it's important that they make the choice because it's something then that they want to do. And, and sometimes the choices have been like dumpster diving or you know like worms under my bed to compost or something. And, and sometimes students are so green that they can't think of anything. And that's the, the real or I'm a climate researcher. I'm in this the whole time. And and the challenge for them is to take an hour and not do anything for me to kind of you know to, to relax, play the guitar, talk to the partner, you know those things. And, and those whatever you choose, it, it's, it's really the engagement with the change. And we give reflection questions on you know, the social because when you don't when you do something and then suddenly you know like not eat meat and then suddenly you see like that oh it's actually you know your your friends are out do they you know you, they made a, a big steak for you and then you're in a social situation where. Meat or I'm not eating meat because I'm doing this experiment. And if you make a moral point of it, like many green people do, you kind of push people away from the trash, aren't you? But if you say you're doing it as an experiment, people go, why? What does meat have to do with climate change? Mm -hmm. Oh, could you actually tell me, oh, actually, um, you know, don't cows eat grass? Isn't grass what you want? Oh, you have to think through and think, okay, what is the logic here? And you start to see the power of social norms, but also your assumptions, because then those people who you're talking with might suddenly go, like, Hmm, maybe I should try that too. Or, you know, and I saw that the students, instead of playing Friday quizzes at lunch, they were starting to talk about, what do I do? How can I do this? And, and when you start to see it from a systems level, you start to see that, like, oh, you know, if there is no vegetarian choice on the mill, if there's no other way to get to Ohio than by airplane, you know, like, I can't take a canoe, I can't, you know, like, um, swim or thing, then, yeah, there's a systemic problem here. And then, oh, maybe I can actually do a video seminar. How, you know, oh, is, can, is that reasonable? But then it could be a very different experience, too. Um, so, so starting to see systems, starting to see the structures that keep us in a place becomes really important, but also then challenging their own beliefs. So it's really going through those different spheres and, and seeing, like, what are your own assumptions about other people, about your mother-in-law, about your, you know, your friends and things? And that when you approach it as an experiment and reflect on it and share, and it's really when through the sharing of stories, of micro-narratives, that people change, you know, that people, and then you start, and maybe not right then, but they will be like, you know, I always use the example that I was at a conference and I met the woman named Peggy Babcock. And she was like, what on earth would anyone ever use a plastic bag when we have these renewable? And every single time I walk by our closet, I'm like, Peggy Babcock, and I take out a renewable bag and go to the store. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, she's just sitting on my shoulder all the time. And whenever I'm in a store, I even buy, like, new reusable bags for 17 kroner because I think Peggy Babcock. And this was just a random conversation at a conference. And so those stories, those narratives, those language, what Alexander Brandt would say, that, that shared language, it spreads, it's, you know, um, you were talking about those examples of where things are happening and, and someone working on uh, a geographer uh, in Al Khoury at Macquarie University was looking at, you know, like these, um, she's very interested in social justice, and looking at like what's going on in Kerala from using a quantum paradigm and the things, and like they are actually doing things in such a different way and challenging those norms and rules, and it's really, you know, challenging the script of globalization. I think there's a lot of scripts we need to challenge right now. Uh, if you go around the world, you get 7.5 million people, and many of these cultures, their worldview is quite different. And if you're in one of these real poor parts of India, that 1.5 degree C is the least of their problems and the things, their worldview of, of what's, what we deal with. And, and to me, this is, this is part of the real challenge is how do you get all of this diversity of people moving in the same direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would argue that that, that, that 1.5 degrees or even half a degree is a really big deal to a lot of people in the world. And I think what you're talking about, you know, like your mother talking about climate change and that, that these things are affecting people and that they are actually, you know, like 
experiencing it, and but they don't necessarily put it aside as climate change. And most people that, whether in Norway or in Namibia, they don't they go like, oh, I'm adapting, no, I'm mitigating, and you know, like separating out these responses in the way that the UNFCCC and the IPCC have have done that. But they're just kind of like, wow, there's a little say, you know, like I don't have access to the market, I don't have, you know, like whatever is we privatize it. It's one big thing about how they're you know looking at change and. And I think, you know, I was very much inspired by Monica Sharma's work because she really just goes, you know, like every person has this capacity for changing some system and you can change your household system of eating, you can change your, you know, your university system of serving trash, you can change your city's system of transportation, you can change your country's system of, you know, um, where, uh, you know, oil production, things like that. So, so we operate in these different areas and people, you know, often we just kind of plop, plop people into like a real world thesis, but it, we have we have that capacity in different situations. See, and that's why you know education is important, but also you know food and you know shelter and in people so that they actually can you know there's this the level of distress you know isn't um, and I think that goes for the United States and Norway as well. Is that you know like so and that becomes an issue of development. So climate change as an environmental problem really becomes climate change as a development problem. You know how do we address that whole thing and, and I think that when we start to, when we start to look at it, climate change is this entry point that gives us the, the time issue that Ellen's talking about. It's like, well, we don't have that much time, but it means that we have to address all the issues that um, of you know like poverty and you know access to resources and conflict and all those things because they are relational problems too, how we look at ourselves in the world. And so so it is really like kind of how do you you know deepen the conversation about climate change and, and make it so that um, you know people actually activate their political agency and the agency for collaborating, you know, collective change. And that you know, like if metaphorically we are entangled, or really we are entangled, or you know, um, mathematically or whatever, it's just important then that we actually like, act it. Because in some ways, a lot of social science shows that we perform our theories and we activate our theories. And so the minute we start to just assume that four degrees is it, and then we start planning for four degrees, and we start investing in four degrees, and we start to you know, say that, like, yeah, in the four degree world, that's all we can get. And I think that's really dangerous, and it goes back to the possible and the probable, that what we think is possible is actually quite going to be the probable, because we haven't pointed out things that some of the things that I didn't even see what was right in front of you. Most of what you're talking about in this presentation is the people who are open-minded and relatively well-educated. What happens or how do you approach people who ideologically have taken the position that, <coughs> to quote a well-known American, that climate change is a hoax? How do you approach those people and deal with them? Because some of those people do have real influence and opinion and policy in this country. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question because and that's one of those things is like where in that collaborative power, how do you work with people who don't share your values or beliefs or whatever reasons? How do you find something to connect with them on that you can actually get? And, and some people, like you might not be the one to approach those people, but there might be a church leader or you know someone that, you know, a friend. So they always talk about like, finding people with like, with like open values that also are part of that community and getting, working with them and having them talk to those people. But, um, but but you know, things are said and done because often you know, like there is, it does involve power, it does involve politics, and it does you know, and so so it's um, and I think just to build those skills so that we can actually connect with people who don't see the world like us and have that the uh, connection, that's you know not easy, and um, I think we run into that every day in us, but that's um, you know that the, that's the, that is the adaptive challenge. You know, and if that, you know, like, the, and it's not a, you can't deal with it in a technical way of just, you know, like, um, injecting people with information and things like that. But, um, but, but I think also, but if you look at younger generations, and I have a project on Voices of the Future, and I'm very interested in, like, youth and their visions and values and things, that those worldviews are changing. And when you look at the electoral map of the United States of the, you know, under 30, it was quite blue. And, you know, th th and those things, I think, to, to, give young people the skills to actually handle these, you know, they do the adaptive work and handle that is, I think that's why education, the, the work that we're doing in universities and high schools and, you know, all the way, you know, daycares and everything is really important. And 
we see in Norway our daycares are, you know, they're starting to be very free to have these programs and, and getting, you know, like, because it's not just what we say, it's what we do, and we are being watched all the time by others in our I wish I could share your optimism. Oh, optimism. <laughs> so I agree on the relation of absolutely. But how do you persuade people when they live in a world where relationality is the last thing on their minds because of the sorts of situations that they're confronted with? They don't care where they're watching it. They don't care that it's people raising meat, for instance. And when they look at some news, they don't think of gender, right? But gender is a major issue in, in meat consumption. You know, it's a massive thing. What do you think in those terms? But they have incentives to think in quite a contrary way, in an atomistic way. They don't see those connections. Right? There's no reason for them to see those connections. So I, 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 I can't show you wrong. But I think I... I mean, I mean we, we live in a world... Uh, sorry, um, we live in a world where, because of our social relations, right, we are extremely atomized. Right? We, don't, we don't experience the world in relational terms. Right? Yes, we should, absolutely, but we don't. Yeah. And, and, and we won't until, this, until the whole social system changes. That's the obstacle. Mm -hmm. But how does that social system change? Because if somebody then is, like... It, it really goes into then how do you, because again, like we fall into this thing that we need to change people as and putting them as the objects in that practical sphere of how do we change people versus actually getting people to change those, those systems and change those, you know, like the norms about eating meat. And um, I have some like colleagues in Mexico who are working with um, like, you know, um, women and violence and everything, and they were doing. Um, you know, of course, it was men and their identities because it was like you can empower women all you want, but if they're back in a system where they get beaten up for you know, wanting something, then it really is about them. And so, bringing people from the Supreme Court of El Salvador and and um, gangs and everything in there and having them do you know things to actually look at their own masculinities, like there are there are just so many different ways. And if you look at like how worldviews change, there are lots of practices that can be used in communities that are you know, engaging. And I have students working with like um, photo voice and um, voice dialogue and different things so that people can actually express. And one working with an um, El Salvadorian person, things like that, they come to Canada and they you know, um, talk about it. And you know, it's devastating for them to realize they cannot feed their family and children and just be crying and having all these like, journalists contribute them and everything. But it, it really is this kind of thing. So how do, yeah, and then my student was just feeling terrible because like, wow, but she knew the woman well by then. But, but it is like constantly we are shattering world views with our, you know, the way we're approaching climate change and then we're telling people that they need to change. So how do you work with, with people in communities and using the skill sets, you know, giving so, so I, I, you know, I don't know that, like, I, I, I don't see myself, as, I see the possible, and I, I think that, that that is, but I don't know, you know, into the probable, <coughs> everybody, everything. So I go between being very, uh, you know, op like, optimistic and pessimistic, and I get most pessimistic after listening to science talks about climate change, so reading The Guardian and those things, and then I get most optimistic when I look at what is going on in the world, and I see what, you know, what comes up on Twitter and, and things of the millions of people that are doing something differently, that are changing. When I talk to young people, it's, you know, it's very inspiring to see that they're challenging them, you know, and one of the studies we were doing on youth is on how they dissent, and there's a very dutiful dissent where they're very, you know, following the, you know, being in the political parties and being very visible and writing the white papers and, and things, and, and then there's very, you know, disruptive dissent where they're, marching and you know, divestment campaigns, but there's also a dangerous descent where it's a danger to power and interest because they're not looking for jobs in the oil industry. They're not going for the jobs in the advertising sector and things like that. And the, those sectors, you know, they come out and say, oh, no, if, they, if we can't recruit young people, what do we do? So um, so I think that, that when people are just kind of working across those different uh, types of descent that, um, yeah, we need to 
empower, I always think like you've got to empower the particle and amplify the wave, you know, so that you actually give people like, you know, a strong sense of agency, but also that collective political agency. Of well, on that note, uh, please join me again and thank you very much.